Now, if you ever watched one of my videos, you've probably noticed that every single time I launch up a terminal, I open up NeoFetch. Now, is this a massive waste of system resources? Yes, I'm not even going to try to argue that point. It is a massive waste of performance. All it does is looks cool. And you know what? I'm more than happy with that. But NeoFetch isn't exactly the quickest application out there. So NeoFetch is written in Bash. And while Bash isn't a slow language by any means, it is an interpreted language. And anything that's interpreted is going to have some performance hit to it. So what if instead of using NeoFetch, we use something, say, written in C? What you're seeing on your screen right now isn't actually NeoFetch. NeoFetch would look a little something like so. What you're actually seeing is an application known as PaleoFetch. So PaleoFetch does most of what you see inside of NeoFetch, but instead it's written in C, and it's configured in the same way as suckless applications by modifying a C header file. If you care about easy customizability and far more features, NeoFetch is by far a better application. But if all you want is a really fast way to get a distro logo and also your memory and things like that printed out on your screen, PaleoFetch might actually be worth looking at. Now there's no point even looking at this if it runs slower than NeoFetch does. So my system can kind of brute force both applications, but even on mine, there is still a noticeable difference. So let's go and run time. NeoFetch, and NeoFetch takes this long, and let's go and run time, and then PaleoFetch, and compare the two. So, NeoFetch takes 0.07 user seconds, 0.03 system seconds, and PaleoFetch is not actually able to read the time because it is so quick. So, I think that's a, a fair point in favor of PaleoFetch being quick. Now, because I'm running an Arch-based distro, that being Arch Linux, Running this application, most of the functionality is going to work. The problem, though, is the developer sort of made this around Arch Linux. So unlike NeoFetch, where if you, say, are using Ubuntu, it's going to show you the packages you have installed here with apt. In this case, it's only going to query Pacman. But because we do have access to the C code, we can go and modify this to do whatever other distro we want. It's just that on those distros, it will require a bit of extra work. So as I mentioned earlier, if you want to go and configure this, it's going to be configured in the same way you configure some sort of suckless application by modifying the C code directly. So in this case, there is three files we care about. We have the paleofetch.c, that is where all of the implementation is. Paleofetch.h, that is where all of the functions are being defined. But the one, if you don't want to modify how the application actually works, you just want to modify how it's configured, config.h is where you want to go. So in here, we have a config macro, which defines where most of the configuration is going to be done. There is a little bit done outside of this, but this is going to be the main block. So inside of here, we have a bunch of different lines, which define what data is actually going to be printed out. So get title is this one here. Get bar is this here. Then we have OS, kernel, so on and so forth. And each of these lines is surrounded by brackets, followed by a comma and a backslash. The backslash is there because you can only define a macro on a single line, and backslashes basically make that line continue going on. So let's go and add, let's say, a, another one of the OS functions here, and we're just going to call this uh, extra line, for example. Now, this is basically what you see on the left-hand side here. So in this case, it's going to print out extra line. And then after that, we want to have the function we want to call. So if we want to get the OS information, that is going to be get underscore OS. And then after that, we want to have whether it's cached or not. Now, whether it's cached depends on how the function is actually being defined. And the documentation for this, like being a subtle application, is not very good. So test out false, test out true, whichever one works, go with that. For every single one of the functions, false is going to work, but if you can cache the information, then you might as well cache it. So let's go and set that to false, and let's go and save this. So to actually apply these changes, we'll have to go and recompile the application. And luckily we get a make file to do so. The problem though, is this make file is sort of lacking. So it doesn't have a make build in here and it also doesn't have a make uninstall. So you can install the application just fine and you can clean the cache, 
but uninstalling the application you'll have to do by hand. I don't know why it's like that, but that's just how it is. Luckily, when we go and run uh, make install though, it will go and overwrite what's already there. So make install, and as we can see, that's finished now. If we go and run the application again, we have that extra line, and it's printing out the OS. Now, there's also a special line we can use, and that is the spacer line. What spacer is going to let you do is basically just insert a new line character. So, let's go and add one, say, here, 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 and we'll add uh, another one here as well. So, if we go and save this again, and then go and rerun make install... And if we go and run the application, as you can see, now there is a bunch of extra new lines. Now, most of the functions are going to be documented inside of the readme. They'll be close to the bottom, and this will actually provide a description of what they actually do. But because you are encouraged to actually go and modify the C file, I wouldn't recommend coming to this unless you're really unsure about what one actually does, because I've noticed the documentation is actually a little bit out of date. So in here, there is a get GPU function, and this function doesn't actually exist in the current version. And one function that's actually missing is get battery percentage. And if you're not using a laptop, this is going to be there in the default configuration, but it should be removed because if you don't remove it, the application is going to crash. I presume in the same way that if you're not using an Arch-based distro, running get packages pacman is also going to cause a crash as well. Now, because this is sort of built around Arch, the current logos that are available are just a couple of variations of the Arch logo. But as you can see, all it is is a string. And one of these was actually basically stolen from NeoFetch. So you could go and say, take the logos from NeoFetch or take the logos from PFetch or take the logos from any of the other Fetch applications. Or you don't even have to have a distro logo here. You could have, say, any sort of ASCII art and that's going to work perfectly fine. You could have like a, a cow say or something here if you really wanted to. So let's go and make a custom logo for this. I'm just going to go and copy this one here, go and rename it, and we'll call it Arch1. Now, all I'm really going to do is go and remove a couple of lines in here and see what actually happens. So let's go and save this now. And if we go back over to the config file, I was testing this early, but what you're going to want to do is change this first include line here from being arch.h to whatever the new logo you want to use is. So by default, you could use two or three, but maybe you want to have like an Ubuntu logo here. But in my case, I'm going to just be using arch1. Now, I did notice a bit of a bug with this, and we'll get to see that right now. So what it does is stops printing at the end of the logo. So if you have, say, the PFetch logo, it's probably going to stop printing after, like, line 6 here. So to fix the bug, there are two ways we can go about fixing it. One of them is actually fixing the bug, but that's way too much effort. I don't want to do that. The easier way to do it is just add some extra lines in here that fill out the space. So what we could do is go and add in, say, a bunch of new lines like this, go and save the file, recompile the application, and this should go and change the logo. Now, sometimes if you do have the logo cached, it won't change straight away. So you might have to go and do a make clean, a make install, and then if you go and run it, it should go and fix it. Now, it's fixed the problem. It's not exactly a fix per se, but it does what we need it to do. Now, if we don't want the color printed out to be cyan, we can also go and modify this as well. So inside of the config header, there is this define color macro. And you'll see this weird syntax here. And what this syntax is, is an ANSI color code. Now, if you don't understand how ANSI color codes work, Luckily for you, there'll be a link in the description that basically has a list of all of the basic ones. So let's say we want the color to be uh, bold and yellow, for example. So what we want to do is modify the 36 in there to 33. And if we go and recompile this, the text should still be bold. In my case, I'm not actually running a bold font, so you can't actually see it be bold, but now the color instead should be yellow. As always with ANSI color codes, you'll see these colors being defined in here, so say red, green, yellow, so on and so forth, and if you go and use it inside of your terminal and say the red is green, that is entirely your fault for happening. So those 16 colors you define inside of your terminal all have very specific meaning, and if you break that meaning and the color codes don't line up with that, there's nothing I can really do to help you with that. You'll have to just go and mess around with it until you find the color you like. 
Now, when it comes to the data being printed out, there are some things missing in here that I'm not exactly a big fan of. So inside of NeoFetch, we can see we have, say, my window manager and my GTK theme and my icon theme and my terminal font. These can't actually be printed out with PaleoFetch in the state that it's currently in, but I could fairly easily go and modify that to actually go and do that. Another thing that it's supposed to be able to do, but doesn't do, is print out my GPU. So there is a GPU function, and I have seen it working with Intel GPUs, but for AMD GPUs at least, it doesn't seem like it's actually going to work properly. Also with the CPU, it doesn't actually print out the CPU temp, it just prints out the CPU model, which is perfectly fine, but I do like having that bit of extra information as well. It's also handling the resolution in a really naive way. So inside of NeoFetch, it prints out each of the individual monitors resolution, so all three of my monitors. Inside of PaleoFetch though, it just prints out the size of the XORG root window, which is still the resolution, but having this extra information here, once again, would be kind of nice to see. This also has kind of an amusing bug. So when I have a blank window like this, you might have noticed this towards the start of the video, it sometimes gets the terminal name wrong. So the last focus window I had was OBS, and if I go and spawn a new terminal, as we can see, it thinks my terminal name is OBS. I'm going to try that again, but this time I'm going to focus on my PC Man FM window and spawn another one. Now the terminal name is PC Man FM. The only time it actually gets the correct terminal name is when the last focus window I had was actually an alacrity terminal. It's not just a problem with non-terminal applications. If I go and open up something like, say, URXVT, and I do the exact same thing. So from this URXVT window, open another one. Now my Alacrity window is known as URXVT. So I think it's querying for the window name before the application has actually launched. Now, as for installing this, there is actually an AUR package for it. But like with suckless applications, there's no point to actually use it because you're sort of intended to actually modify the source code. And when you install something as a package, even though you can get access to the source code, you're most likely not going to bother doing so. This is one of the few times where I would actually avoid using the package and instead just go and download the source code from the GitHub page and then go and compile it with the make file, making the modifications to it that I want to make and then going from there. Now, does this application feel kind of thrown together? Kind of? Uh, actually, no, yes. It is absolutely thrown together and there are definitely places where it could really be improved. And I think that a C version of NeoFetch actually could be a really cool application if it got actually properly developed, had a bunch of different things you could go and print out, was basically just a re-implementation of NeoFetch inside of C, even with the Suckler sort of configuration, I still think it actually works really well. It's just that in its current state, and it's not really being worked on at this point, PaleoFetch for most people, probably isn't going to be worth using unless you are like me and just want something on your terminal. Something that is worth using, though, is Linode. If it runs on Linux, you can run it on Linode. They have the distros you'd expect available like Ubuntu and Debian, but also Arch and Gentoo because why not? They've got multiple server plans available, so whether you want to host a blog or even a personal VPN, there'll be one that fits you. I'll be using Linode to host all of my community game nights. If you need help, Linode has 24-7, 365 support available by phone, regardless of your plan size. Right now, you guys can get started on Linode with $100 credit by going to the link on screen or in the description down below. Linode was in the game three years before Amazon entered cloud computing, so you know they know their stuff. A huge thank you to Linode for sponsoring the channel. Ultimately, most of the Fetch applications are pretty much the same, and when you're at the point where it's taking less than a tenth of a second to actually run, do you really need something faster? I'll leave that up to you. So I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim Donald, Michael Andre, Nathan David Will, Brennan, Chica Bento, Jamie Joseph, Mitchell Peter D, Stephen Turner Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, the link's down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, Libre pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey and BitChute if you'd like to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.